You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Today we continue our conversations in the Set Apart to Serve series, and it's a voice that is very familiar to you if you listen to KFUO. The Reverend Doug Gribbenaugh, his mission advocate here at KFUO, also guest on the Sharper Iron from time to time and host of a music in the afternoon here on KFUO. That's right, the afternoon music block, right? <laughs> Heard Monday through Friday, weekdays on KFUO. So, Pastor Gribbenaugh, we've invited you to be a part of the Set Apart to Serve series because in this season, we're talking about those who have become church workers in a second season in life. So, as a second career, let's talk about your career before you went to seminary, before you were even thinking about becoming a pastor. In what ways were you, well, what did you study in school and where did it go from there? Well, certainly, you know, I I went to college with this grand vision that I was going to be an electrical engineer, computer science double major, and I was going to work in computers and design computers. I, Because I love computers. I taught myself to type so I could program in basic on my Apple IIe, right? Nice. (laughs) It all started because my brother had a locked program on his disk, and I was going to break it because I'm the little brother, and that's how it goes. And, you know, after three years of, of doing, you know, very hard bachelor of science work and finally sitting in my dorm room by myself coding for a few hours a night, I came to the realization that I kind of missed people. (laughs) And so up in the middle of nowhere, right between the third and fourth year of college, I changed majors. And it just so happened that I was able to complete my degree within the four years if I got a degree in communications. And so there I did. I I ended up finishing with a Bachelor of Arts in Communications with an emphasis in public relations and a minor in leadership. And then I was unemployed for a year. (laughs) That's how it goes, right? I ended up working at a temp agency. And one of the fellows that that was there, he was moving on to work at Catholic Charities, the Archdiocese of Denver, Roman Catholic Church. And he said to me, you know, Doug, would you like to have a full time job? To which I said, oh, well, absolutely. So I I ended up doing data entry for the donation department of Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of Denver. And I was there for another nine and a half years, eventually spending my time doing fundraising and development for Works of Mercy to, to feed the hungry, to shelter the homeless, to care for widows and orphans. And it was really quite fulfilling. Now, I had thought of possibly becoming a pastor right after college. And my father and I went and visited Concordia Seminary, St. Louis. It was a lovely trip. We had a very nice time. But, you know, it really wasn't the right time to go. And in truth, I, I lacked some discipline, personal discipline. And so in the intervening 10 years, I enlisted in the United States Navy, <clears throat> had my college degree, but... I, I, I needed that time scrubbing toilets and saluting everything that moved. <laughs> but it did help to mature me some. And in the course of those 10 years, I found and was engaged to and married to my, my lovely wife, Holly. And and the, the desire to be engaged in a vocation of service it never really went away. It, it was fulfilled quite nicely in working with, you know, donations to gathering the the gifts of others to help and care for those less fortunate. But, you know, that that personal interactivity was was still there. And of course, in the course of that 10 years, my, my home congregation pastor asked me if I'd consider being on the Board of Christian Education. So I started volunteering in the church a little bit and eventually ended up being president of the Board of Education, becoming one of the elders in the church, a younger elder. And, and before leaving for seminary, which kind of came out of the blue, I was elected to be president of the congregation. And so lots of, lots of time in the church, lots of time working in this work of service. And ultimately it came to, well, let's see, it was 2010. It was a year after my wife and I were married. And it was about almost 10 years after my father and I had visited Concordia Seminary, St. Louis. And we had called a, a new pastor 
fresh out of the seminary, Pastor Michael Meyer, who actually happens to work here at the International Center now. And we thought, well, we were kind of looking for a change, kind of looking to mix things up. And we went to visit Concordia Seminary St. Louis in the fall of 2010. And again, another lovely visit. I even saw a kitty cat on the campus, and I love cats. But, you know, something just it wasn't the right time. So my wife and I decided that, well, we were going to find jobs in Las Vegas, Nevada. We were going to move there and start our new life in, in the city that we love because my wife and I had been engaged in Las Vegas and married in Las Vegas at, on two separate trips. I always make that clear. <laughs> and, and then we had a, a really wonderful recognition of a civil ceremony back at our home church in Denver. So we, we traveled out to Las Vegas and we looked at apartments and and when we finally came back, you know, we had this plan. We were both submitting resumes, getting ready to go. And when, as soon as one of us had a job, we're pulling up stakes and shipping out west to Las Vegas, Nevada. Well, Pastor Meyer, you know, approached me and said, no, you visited Concordia Seminary St. Louis. Have you visited Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne? And so out of a sort of sense of obligation, you know, this is our pastor. That was, that was the seminary he attended. Well, why not? We'll just, we'll give it a go. It's not the right time to go off to seminary. You know, maybe I'm just not supposed to be a pastor. It's, it's fine, but we'll go and do it. And after four days of exploring the campus, spending time with the pastors, the seminary students, chatting with some of the pastors who were in the, in the recruiting department, right? It was the very last night that we were on the campus and we walked around the campus a little bit. And my wife knows me. <laughs> I'm a bit of a headstrong fellow sometimes. And she just put it out there. She said, you know, maybe you're just not supposed to be a pastor. And something just said, no, I, I, I think that's what I should do. And so she finally pushed me over the edge to say and be serious. Well, okay, what do we need to do? And so this was March of 2011 and I'm trying to get my, my years right because I graduated 2016, 16 to 15, 15 to 14, 14 to 13, 13 to 12. So it was 2012 actually, excuse me, 2012, March of 2012 and in earnest asked, what do I need to do? You need to get your GRE and you need to have Greek. Oh, I, I don't have any pre-seminary education. In fact, I, I was not the most disciplined student of the scriptures. So there are some insurmountable sort of objects that are awaiting us. But we came back and I put in all the things to be a, take my graduate records examination, to put in the application, start writing the essays, and we took another trip out to Vegas. Maybe it was one of those things where you're just in the moment, you think, yeah, let's, yeah, well, sure, let's do it. So we went back to Vegas. We toured more apartments where we thought we'd live. We stopped at our favorite little cafe, the Leon Cafe, the Tivoli you know, shopping center off in Summerlin. We're sitting there sipping our cappuccinos. And I looked at my wife and I said, I think, I think we should go to seminary. And she looked at me and she said, yeah, I think so too. Sitting there in the city we love, the place we wanted to live. And it was, just, it was the right thing to do. And so from, from May until June, in about the span of four weeks, we put in our two weeks at our jobs, we packed up our house, and we drove to Fort Wayne, arriving on a Friday, and I started Summer Greek on Monday in June. And it was quite literally one of the hardest things I've ever done. I don't have a, a, an ear or a mind for languages. <laughs> and I spent 10 weeks eating, drinking, sleeping, Greek, and and I... And and it was so hard and yet so fulfilling at the same time. And there's, there's one thing I, I cannot stress enough to anyone who is thinking about seminary, thinking about maybe pursuing you know, uh, the divine call, is that the, the physical location of being there, struggling and, and wrestling with God's word and, and learning these languages and learning how to think theologically, the resident education being in that physical place, there's so much more than just the learning. It really is a place where the Holy Spirit is working to form you, to shape you, to change you from who you had been into, into this, this 
this under shepherd that he's calling you to be. And as, as struggling and difficult as that is, it is also incredibly fulfilling. And it's not without a lot of scares. It's not with a lot of tribulation. But when the Holy Spirit has, has given you that nudge, it's a hard thing to ignore. And it does take a, a lot of, of faith also from, from your wife. We didn't have children at the time, but if we'd had kids, a lot from them to move from this regular human life of, you know, you, you build your house and home, you, you, you're almost in a way sort of working for yourself to shift into this entirely new reality of, of working for God, putting that hand to the plow. And it's hard not to look back, but it is also incredibly rewarding. So don't ignore it. If, if you're out there with that little, little voice in the back of your head, I hope you have a helpmeet like mine who knows how to push those buttons and say, you know, get off the fence. You mentioned your wife, your dad, your pastor. Were there others who were supportive and encouraged you as well? Or what was what was special about their support? I'm trying to consider that it was, my, my father was a, a, a good and, and, and faithful man. It, and is my dad's still alive? Hi, Papa. <laughs> but in the context of the time, and and we we did we attended church consistently, not not overly well, you know. And we were sometimes a wee bit late. But I can't say that there was any particular one watershed moment. It was it was this environment of of the church life, and. You know, perhaps I'm going to round about here. Probably the, the the most impactful person was my pastor. Not that he was saying, you know, you should go off and be a pastor. You, know, you should study these things. But that he engaged me in the life of the church. So Pastor Schlechte asked me, would you serve? And, I, and you know, when your pastor asks you to do something, maybe this is an old way of, of thinking things, you just you got to say yes. And so I did. But that really is what started me, you know, got my toe in the water. And and service in the church, you know, it's not always a wonderful thing. There's, there's a lot of struggles. We are a congregation of saints and sinners. But it, it put my toe in the water. And it really started to, to lead me that way. And the current, the Holy Spirit working through that current, you know, pushed me along. So really, so to my brother pastors out there, you know, Ask, some, ask your people to be involved in the life of the church. And I know so many of them are going to say no. But let the Holy Spirit do his work through that as well. That is, I think, really what made the turn in my life. We are continuing our conversations in the Set Apart to Serve series. Today, our guest is Pastor Doug Gribben, a mission advocate here at KFUO. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment right here on The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. We are continuing our conversation in the Set Apart to Serve series. Our guest today, Pastor Doug Gribbenau, mission advocate here at KFUO, who is a second career pastor, you might say, having served in multiple careers before coming to, before going to seminary, both in development and also a military career as well. And that's true. I, you know, I, I was concurrently serving in the United States Navy Reserve while I was working at Catholic Charities, the Archdiocese of Denver, and, uh, and, and really sort of being formed in, in two ways. And I, I think that back life experience, looking 
you know, in hindsight, the Holy Spirit was working to really shape me, to mature me from from a young man into an adult, to engage me in, in, in a life of service, in a vocation that is focused on serving others and caring for others, and, and really bringing me then, and, and of course my pastor engaging me then in the life of the church, that, that all of these things wrapping together and engaging with so many other people. That's another thing is that I was, I was touching and, and meeting with folks from all sorts of walks of life. And that's one of the wonderful things of our military is you get to meet people from all over the country. And, and you have this common bond. For, for me, it was we were all shipmates. You know, we were sailors. And, and you see how this, this commonality. Same thing in the life of the church. You meet people from all over the country. In the Missouri Synod, you probably have bumped into about three or four of them five or six times because we, we tend to run in the same circles. But you, and you start to have this wonderful united identity. We are redeemed children of God. And it was engaging with so many different people and the wonderful complexity of, of our human existence. That, that's, that really is part of what's so fun about being a pastor is engaging with people from all sorts of walks of life. And the, and the enjoyment I had in those engagements, I think, helped to open my eyes to the joy of, of being the shepherd, and uh, you know, or I should say the under-shepherd, under Christ Jesus, to, to engage with and care for people. But So you and your wife made the decision to go to seminary, you move to Fort Wayne, you take the summer intensive Greek class, which was challenging. Incredibly so. <laughs> Tell us more about your your formation as a pastor, the classes you took, as well as field education uh, or field experience, what was that like? What were some of the classes that you took that that were, I, I mean, all the classes certainly are important to your formation as a pastor. What were some of the classes that stood out for you? You know, one of the things that, that has struck me as I reflected on this time was sort of a, a, a terrible fear. And, and I mean this in, in almost the old Hebrew good way. You know, we, we think of engaging the Word of God as, as almost a sort of casual thing. So many of us, we have our Bible study, but, but we don't really wrestle with the depth of it, at least in my own experience, pre-seminary, that yeah, I read my Bible, I, I read my little devotion, you pick up the devotion book, but there was not this intense wrestling, which is, which is what they make you do at seminary. And, they, and, they, and there's a training in terms of a discipline and the way in which you engage the text. And so you're dealing with something more, let's be honest, dangerous than nuclear materials. You're dealing with the sword that is sharper than any two-edged sword. This is the word of God that, 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 that kills and it makes alive. And when you really understand that and the gravitas of, of what that is, it's, it's a humbling thing. And, and you have your professors pushing you in the deep end of the pool to, to study the Old Testament, the New Testament, to begin to learn the discipline of how to engage Scripture, that Scripture interprets Scripture, that our, our faith is really one doctrine. And, and one of the examples, I believe it was Martin Luther, correct me if I'm wrong, that you know, our faith, the doctrine of our faith is, is a golden ring. And the articles therein all interconnect and support and, and build this unified whole. And if one of those things is out of joint, the whole of this doctrine falls apart. And so you learn to discipline your own perspective, your own reading, and let the text speak for itself. Because the truth is that God's Word says a lot of things that we don't like. Because the old Adam within us hates God's Word. And, and you have to subdue his, his revolt and his rebellion within you and, and take God at his word. And it, it leads us to places we don't want to go, but it's the places the Holy Spirit puts us through. So we have Old Testament, New Testament, you know, you have terms of systematics, teaching you how to think about Scripture and put all these pieces together. Dogmatics, the things we know, the dogma from the, from the, uh, the Latin, I know. And I remember sitting in my very first class for for the New Testament. It was the Gospel of Matthew. And the professor said, I'm a second career guy, never had any pre-sem training. And he probably, I, I know he just assumes that they ever, everyone knew what he was talking about. He said, you're going to write an exegetical 
on a piece of, on, on a pericope. And there were two words in there that I had no knowledge of. Pericope, I have no idea what that is. And an exegetical, I, 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 an exoatical. I literally had to go up to my professor and I said, I don't know what you want me to do. What is this thing? And so I was given a, a sample exegetical, and it's from the word exegesis, which means to, to draw forth or to come out of, generating out of the text, letting the text speak for itself. And you go through in the original language, line by line, you look at your own translation, you know, investigate the words, and then start to look at the body of, of Scripture, what's nearby, what's in other parts, and, and sort of let the text speak. A pericope... From the, uh, from the Greek to cut around. So it's a little selection of scripture. So it's, you know, you're reading your, your piece that you're pulling out. And so there's this, there was this acclamation I had to do into this new culture of the church, learning, you know, fancy Greek and Latin terms. And uh, sometimes pastors, we, we get so used to that after four years of, of talking the shop that when we get into the parish, we sometimes continue to talk shop. So, uh, so if, if you're in the pew and you don't know a word that your pastors use, just ask him and, and say, I'm not sure what you mean by an exegetical, <laughs> things along those lines. But beyond that, it was it was the time in chapel because we would go to class, we'd have daily chapel, half an hour, and then coffee fellowship afterwards, and then right back at it. But that time spent with your brothers, with your pastors, it, it shapes and changes you over the course of these years. And really, I, I, I hardly even recognize who I was in 2016 than who I was in 2012. And it's a remarkable transformation, but a subtle one that, that I can't say would have taken place with just the, the book knowledge, studying on my own, remotely with myself, but through those daily interactions and learning the, the discipline of, of the life of the church, of being engaged in God's word and then hearing his word proclaimed each and every day. We have just a couple of minutes left. You mentioned during your college career as a student studying computer science and coding in your room several hours a night, realizing that you really like to be around people. And perhaps this isn't the path for you, being uh, uh, behind the desk, hiding in a, in a cubicle somewhere, always writing code, maybe isn't a path for you. You wanted to be in something that you could interact with people on a regular basis the Lord brings you to seminary through this pastoral formation. You go into field education, vicarage, which is like a one-year internship, and then first call, all these places where you get to interact with people. What did you, did you see fulfillment of what you were hoping for, getting to interact with people? Well, as always, you know, the, the vision is, is rarely <laughs> the reality. But, the, and that's the truth, is that we, we, we deal with in the Office of the Ministry True, true humanity, the very best and the very worst. We cry with those who are crying. We rejoice with those who are rejoicing. It is the life of the whole church. But we, at least culturally, sometimes have this sort of everything's fine. You know, how are you doing today? Ah, good. How are you? And we don't actually have these deep conversations. But, but pastors, well, that's who you're supposed to have these deep conversations with. So people open up a little more. And you see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and it's a wonderful, it, it, it is a wonderful thing. To, to be in the trenches with people because our Lord is, our Lord's there right with us. And I, I have to say probably the, one of the things that moved me towards this, this life of service was I, I was dating a girl in college whose, whose father had tried to commit suicide. And I basically just took some time off my, my third year and went and lived with them. And it was in, sense sort of the, the intermediary with the dad because they were understandably very upset with him and, and hurt. And it, it put me almost in, the, in a similar role to a pastor is in caring for others. And there was, there was a tremendous joy in, in giving comfort to others. And, uh, and even, even though that, that, that relationship did not, uh, did not develop further, it was that, that time spent caring for those in, in the deepest hurt that, that resonated with me in, in a way that I hadn't expected. For the man who might be considering seminary and pastoral formation to, to consider becoming a pastor, a second career, who might be thinking about that seminary experience and be a little perhaps 
frightened by the idea of going back to school again at this point in life, having served in a career for a while. The thought of taking Greek might be even terrifying to some. What might you share with that man? The fraternity of 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 your of the brethren. Everyone at seminary is invested in you. That you yourself, your spouse, your family, your your classmates, your professors, every single person there is is there to help and support you. And let's not forget the Holy Spirit as well, working to guide and direct you. And and so it's it is a time of tremendous challenge, but you have a wonderful family and network that really want you to do well and want you to do to do right we'll say right you know to be orthodox and faithful and and having that support really really can't overcome the fear but part of it is just taking that plunge and 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 going i i often think of our lord when he says you know he who has set his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of god but as opposed to being such a negative view, I mean, it, there's this, this sobering reality that when you pursue this vocation, the old life is, is, is gone. You, you, you are going to be placed where you're away from family, very likely, where you're very isolated from friends into this new region, this new area, to build and develop a new life. What you've left behind is there, but you can't ever go back again. And, and not in a bad or a good way, but a realization that you've been called out of that old world and into a new reality. And it's a good place to be. But, but the other thing is that the things that are most frightening to us, and I mean this in a general sense for all peoples, the things that are most frightening to us, that scare us the most, I've often found are the things that give us the greatest growth and the greatest joys. Our guest today, Pastor Doug Grivenaugh, Mission Advocate at KFUO Radio. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us here on The Coffee Hour. You're very welcome. You can learn more about Set Apart to Serve by visiting lcms.org slash SAS. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere.